ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي إلا بالله العلي العظيم سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم. Let's get started. Yes, I think we can we can start with the other first. Okay, thank you so much. Nahmad who on the cell. Alaikum salam, Rahmatullah Barakatu Halan, Wasahalan, no more habit. Shukran Jazila. Nahmad who on the cellimo, Allah Rasul Kareem, Assalamu alaikum, Warahmatullahi, Barakatu. Ladies and gentlemen, as we are about to begin, let me do some housekeeping notes to ensure that this virtual event can run smoothly. First, I would like to remind those who are on the camera to dress appropriately. You are allowed to turn off your camera. However, please do not forget to turn it on at the end of the session for the photography session. Second, please prepare your questions and you may raise the question in the chat box and our speaker will answer them at the end of the session. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Prof. Dr. Shukran Abdurrahman, Dean, Kulia of Islamic Revealed Knowledge and Human Sciences. Our speaker, Prof. Dr. Abdul Aziz Barghouz, Deputy Deans, Deputy Director, Heads of department, Departments, Head of Research, professors, associate professors, doctors, academic members, and last but not least, our young graduates and students. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wa alaikum salam. Alhamdulillah, praise be to Allah. We are able to convene this morning to participate in Hadith of Sabah, organized by the Abdul Hamid Abu Sulaiman Kulli of Islamic Reveal Knowledge and Human Sciences International Islamic University, Malaysia. My name is Muhammad Jifri Muhammad Arafat Karim. I am having PhD 
in fiqh and usul al fiqh currently uh, i am the vice chairperson of research bureau of the revealing knowledge and human sciences graduate society and it is an honor to be the mc for this session and on behalf of the kulliya i would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you all right before we go further let us begin our program today with the recitation of ummul kitab surah al fatiha bismillahir rahmanir rahim alhamdulillah rabbil alamin ar rahmanir rahim maliki yawmid din iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in ihdinas siratal mustaqim siratal ladhina an'amt alayhim ghayril maghdubi alayhim raddallin without further delay let me briefly introduce our speaker today today our speaker is honorable professor dr abdul aziz barghouz dean international institute of islamic thought and civilization welcome prof barakallahu feekum uh before i hand over session to professor abdul aziz barghouz let me inform you that he will be delivering his talk for 30 minutes and we will open the floor for question and answer for 15 minutes so i will welcome prof dr abdul aziz barghouz falyatafaddal mashkuran wa majura ahlan bikum assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh do you hear me there aywa can you hear doctor alhamdulillah rabbil alamin والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين uh, Dear Professor Shukran, the Dean of the Kulia Abdul Hamid Abu Suleiman Kulia of Islamic Reviewed Knowledge and Human Sciences The Deputy Deans, the Directors, the researchers, scholars, our academicians, our administrators Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. First of all, I'm very, very glad to be invited to this uh, very important uh, hadith al-sabah. And uh, I think this is one of the very successful programs of our kulliya. Uh, and, and the topic you uh, give me to uh, deal with Um, higher education in the Islamic world is actually one of the most difficult and the most hard topics to deal with uh, because of uh, many reasons, brothers and sisters. Uh, talking about higher education, even in one country, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll need a lot of uh, thinking and very collective kind of uh, efforts. Uh, to understand the educational system uh, and then see uh, what are the, uh, the issues or challenges or the strengths or weaknesses of, a, of an educational system. Here we are talking about uh, higher education in the Islamic countries. This is, uh, uh, this is I think, uh, it can be uh, a topic of uh, conferences and uh, think tank. works and uh, uh, you know intellectual activities however um, i just narrow down the topic to maybe uh, to highlight some issues of higher education in the islamic countries as i said uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the issues with regard to studying Uh, and dealing with higher education in the Islamic world is the lack of uh, data and information uh, about the uh, education, uh, especially higher education uh, in many Muslim countries. Uh, I would like just to start with a, a general introduction uh, to show you how uh, this uh, issue of um, higher education in Islamic countries is very crucial. and we have to attend to uh, higher education so that we can really move the ummah 
and the Islamic world to other levels of development, brothers and sisters. Uh, when we talk about the uh, Islamic world, uh, we are talking about the Muslim Ummah, whether the uh, majority countries or the minority also, the Muslim minorities uh, everywhere uh, in the world today can be uh, from the perspective of Ummah and Ummatic, they can be part and parcel of the Islamic world, even though they are in other places. But their belief system, their cultural system, uh, their um, uh, style of life, way of life uh, in the end is related to Islam and uh, Islamic societies. Uh, brothers and sisters, uh, let's look at it from um, the perspective of the Islamic world or the Muslim world or the Muslim Ummah. Let's look at it from the current existing uh, kind of um, uh, groupings uh, which we have in the Islamic world so that we can understand and see how uh, higher education is being dealt with in Muslim countries. We have the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, where you have 57 member countries, including almost uh, uh, all the uh, Muslim uh, countries, not almost, but all the Muslim countries are part and parcel of this grouping of the OIC, and uh, uh, including in Africa, in Asia here, in the Middle East, in North Africa, and all these uh, countries, they have their educational systems, whether the uh, public lower education or the higher education. Uh, and I think Malaysia, Indonesia, Southeast Asia region is part and parcel, uh, and uh, East Asia and other parts, as you see in the picture over there. Now, this is one of the platforms where you can uh, see the uh, higher education or see how Muslim countries are dealing with um, uh, higher education. Now, under the OIC, uh, we have another institute, another body, which is called the ISESCO, the ISESCO, which is uh, Islamic Organization for uh, education, science, and culture. It's like the, uh, it's like the uh, counterpart of uh, what we call the UNESCO. You know, UNESCO uh, is a body which is under the United Nations and linked to the United Nations and handles issues and of education, science, and culture. And, and, and as you see, under, uh, under uh, the UNESCO, uh, hundreds of countries are there. And um, uh, in fact, nowadays, the Islamic world also, uh, many universities in the Islamic world are adopting the, uh, the uh, approaches and the ways how the UNESCO is handling uh, higher education brothers and sisters. So when you talk about uh, SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, uh, number four, for example, talking about education, uh, uh, the UNESCO is in the forefront of this with the United Nations. And if you see the way how the UNESCO is handling higher education and education is very sophisticated. The resources they put, the way how they govern, the way how they manage, the way how they promote the uh, version uh, of the UNESCO of managing and handling uh, higher education uh, in the Western world and then in the world, uh, compared to uh, the ISESCO, for example, as a body uh, which is trying to uh, handle uh, education, especially higher education in the Islamic world, uh, there is a difference in the way how uh, things managed. I think the ISESCO needs a lot of uh, work uh, to move higher education in the Islamic world. Now, what is under the, this is the OIC, then you have the ISESCO and under the ISESCO, there are several, because ISESCO also is a body for education, science, and uh, culture. 
for education, uh, they, there are meetings of uh, uh, ministers of education and ministers of higher education uh, under the uh, ICESCO to look at the uh, issues uh, and challenges of higher education. I say school like a body, it's not actually imposing anything on uh, uh, Muslim countries, but it's like a consultative, it's like a kind of a, a platform, a body where uh, they are trying to bring all the uh, stakeholders of higher education in the Ummah, which are the higher, the ministries of higher education and ministries of education and address the issues uh, of uh, uh, higher education. ICESCO helps like providing guidelines, some kind of, <clears throat> uh, uh, kind of uh, policies, but they are not uh, really uh, compulsory or obligatory, but they are just consultative to help the countries uh, uh, try to develop their uh, uh, higher education. The other organ, which is under the ICESCO, uh, sorry, under the OIC, they call it SESTRIC, SESTRIC. It's like an organization, it's like a, a body doing of statistics and analysis and studies, which does studies about the OIC, the Islamic countries in all areas, especially in education. Sestrik is a body which is in Turkey, uh, but it is under the uh, OIC, brothers and sisters. So Sestrik is meant to be like an institute which does a lot of analysis, a lot of research, a lot of uh, uh, studies relate to the development of the Islamic world the OIC member countries in all aspects, including these SDGs. If you now Google SESTRIC, you will find that they have a lot of studies, a lot of reports on uh, uh, what we call um, uh, development of the Islamic Ummah. Uh, 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 in the education, when you check and uh, uh, see the, some of the studies they did uh, under the uh, higher education and education and mostly on uh, education, lower education. Uh, in higher education, I think they need to do more studies so that we can, uh, we can uh, develop more um, uh, platforms and approaches and strategies of how to develop higher education in the Islamic world, uh, brothers and sisters. So this introduction to me is very important to put to put higher education in Islamic countries in the uh, context. Now, to add another important point, you will notice that uh, in the Muslim uh, countries, that each and every Muslim country has its own educational system, whether the lower education, the public uh, or private, or the higher education or the vocational education. Uh, and and uh, almost, if you see the situation and the context, there is independence and there is autonomy uh, in each country managing um, uh, its own higher education system. For example, if we take the example of Malaysia, uh, it has its own visions, its own strategies, its own way of dealing with uh, education. And of course, it collaborates with others, whether in the West or in the East or in the rest of the world, uh, uh, and is also part and parcel of the OIC uh, uh, countries. Uh, why I'm mentioning this, just to mention that one of the issues uh, of higher education uh, in the Islamic countries is the lack of uh, what, you what we call a unifying or uniting kind of a vision for higher education that brings together all the Muslim countries and they have a vision for higher education for the Ummah in the next, for example, 50 years or 60 years. What we have today, each and every culture, a country has its own vision, strategies, uh, governance models, quality models, uh, handling its own. 
And there is no that document, for example, which says this is the vision and the strategy of the Ummah or the Islamic countries for the development of higher education. Uh, this, this, for example, uh, if, if we take another area, which is science and technology, OIC as like a platform where all these countries are there, uh, they managed to have what they call uh, vision, uh, science and technology vision 2041, where they come up with a vision, uh, uh, where a vision and a strategy, a document. It's not compulsory on uh, countries, but at least it's a guiding kind of a document which guides and puts a vision for science and technology in the Islamic world. Uh, so, <laughs> if, uh, yes. so, sorry, uh, can you, uh, there is a request for you to click the presentation mode so that we can okay. see what you write on the slides. Uh, in fact, okay. All right. Yeah, uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, in fact, this is, I'm just still in the first, uh, <laughs> in the first slide. But anyway, uh, okay. I, I just want this introduction to be in your mind so that we understand that one of the uh, uh, major issues which I'm going to highlight is this issue of need for uh, a common collective unifying kind of a vision a strategy for islamic countries when it comes to uh, higher education and its development where all the countries like, like when you go to europe there is a vision for European education and uh, uh, many institutions, many things like uh, in mobility they have, Erasmus Mendes, in, in research they have grants, in all these things they have. But for us, I think, uh, as Muslim countries, we need to move uh, that way so that uh, I'm not talking about countries uh, having their own educational system and higher education system and managing it. Yes, that one we have. And uh, one of the things that you will notice that is a very huge uh, disparity uh, between the uh, countries when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to the higher education system, brothers and sisters. Um, you know, uh, you, you will find also. Uh, I just, if you notice in the uh, in the uh, here uh, in in this slide now, you see here uh, some kind of statistics uh, of literacy, for example, uh, in uh, in in the world. If you look at your left side, you see how is the literacy. And if you look at the, uh, the, the right side and you see how is the Islamic world faring when it comes to literacy, we'll find a lot of disparity uh, uh, and differences among Muslim countries themselves. Some of them are uh, very good, uh, doing well. Some of them are uh, still in the middle and some, some of them are in the lower. And, uh, and the uh, state of literacy tells a lot about your educational uh, system. Them, uh, brothers and sisters. So, and also the amounts of money that you uh, spend for education and for higher education in particular, and for research, for example, uh, in higher education, it tells a lot also uh, about uh, your state of your um, uh, education. And in particular here, we are talking about uh, uh, higher education. You will find that Muslim countries are among the lowest countries in terms of spending, for example, uh, 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 for the uh, research in higher education compared to many other countries uh, in the world, brothers uh, and sisters. Uh, 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 even, even when you uh, uh, see how uh, the people look at their education and how they look at uh, 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 how they handle uh, education, you will see uh, through what they spend, through how much effort they put in that one, you can, uh, in fact, understand, uh, sorry, uh, in fact, you can understand uh, how is the situation uh, uh, with regard to your uh, higher education system. Now, brothers and sisters, uh, let me just uh, take you uh, 
quickly to another thing. Uh, today, we are uh, going to speak about uh, higher education in the Islamic world, and I will uh, focus on uh, certain issues uh, which uh, are uh, facing the uh, uh, Islamic Ummah here. Uh, uh, of course, I don't want to, because of the time, I don't want to go to uh, uh, too many details, but just raise some issues and then we come in our discussions, uh, we talk about them. In the, the, in the presentation here, there are many information information uh, about the uh, uh, higher education compared to Islamic compared to others. But let me zoom in into some of the issues uh, we are, that are facing us uh, in higher education. Uh, brothers and sisters, the first issue you notice here, issue of the philosophy and objectives of education, especially if we look at it from the perspective of IIUM because we are a very unique kind of a university which has a mission which is very unique, challenging the current philosophies uh, of education and objectives of education, especially the dominating Western uh, model. So we have an issue, uh, studies shown that uh, there are many differences in the philosophies of educational systems in uh, many Muslim uh, countries. And you will notice that uh, the dominating uh, trend in many of the uh, educational philosophies and objectives of education uh, are uh, uh, many Muslim countries are still Western. Uh, oriented or Western driven uh, kind of philosophies and objectives of education uh, where the secular approach uh, to education uh, is still dominating in many uh, Islamic countries. Uh, when I say uh, uh, philosophy and objectives of education here, we, we mean that uh, in the end, uh, many Muslim countries uh, what we consume, what we teach uh, are the Western uh, knowledge, social science, human science, uh, natural science, medical science, architect architecture, engineering, ICT, uh, all 90% um, or more of the content that we teach of the course outlines that we teach, of the books that we use for teaching, of the certificates and the standards of certificates that we give are all related to the, uh, uh, what we call the uh, uh, dominating model uh, of education. Alhamdulillah, uh, some countries, they, uh, they manage to uh, have their own uh, philosophy of education and objective in which you see their culture, their tradition, their values are being integrated in the system. For example, we are here in Malaysia uh, and they have what they call Pendidikan Felsafa or Nigara Pendidikan Felsafa where you, you, when you read it, uh, you will see that there is uh, uh, there is uh, uh, an impact of the socio-cultural uh, uh, context. But in some other uh, countries, in the end, um, uh, still, the, because when we say the philosophy of education and its objective are related to the Western uh, model, uh, means means what? Means the the attributes of the graduate the quality of the graduate that you are trying to produce uh, will be actually influenced by that philosophy of education. That's why you will find that not many models of education, even in Islamic countries, uh, stressing the importance of values uh, and the importance of ethics uh, in, uh, in, 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 in science, for example in human science and social sciences. And when I say uh, values and ethics and moralities, I mean from the Islamic uh, perspective, because in the end we are uh, Islamic uh, countries 
where Islam uh, is uh, the dominating religion. So uh, this issue need to be addressed and we need to deal with uh, higher education starting from here, because if we have issues in the philosophy, the objectives, the attributes of the graduates, then we will have issues later on in defining the curriculum, in defining the course outlines. And then you will see that most of the knowledge that we consume and we do uh, is is almost Western oriented. I'm not saying we are against Western knowledge in social science or human science or natural science. We adapt the knowledge which is Mahmoud, which is relevant, which is important, but we put it in our own framework, in our own uh, uh, brothers and sisters, in our own way of looking and doing things. Don't take uh, IIUM, for example, as an example, because if you are living in IIUM, you might not feel this issue. But if you are living in Islamic countries where the educational system is secular, and where students spend four years, for example, studying engineering, architecture, soci sociology, psychology, anthropology, ICT, and this, and they don't see anything related to uh, Islamic values or Islamic uh, way of looking at education, then you will notice. But UIE is in the forefront of what we call integrated value-based education in the Islamic world brothers and sisters, plus the other Islamic universities like in Al-Azhar or Al-Qarawiyin or Al-Zaytuna or Al-Madina or, or, or. But what, what is unique about IIUM is we are trying to integrate the modern, uh, the conventional knowledge and the Islamic knowledge in a very modern and sophisticated kind of uh, an approach, as I will tell you late, uh, later. Now, the second issue as I mentioned, in the uh, Islamic uh, countries, lack of a common, I'm not talking about lack of uh, uh, higher education policies or systems or no, they have and they introduce, they produce, they nurture, millions of graduates are coming from Islamic university. But later on, you will have the question of what type of graduate you are talking about, what quality of graduate we are talking about for the Ummah. So lack of common unifying and uh, collective higher education vision, uh, which unifies and has some bigger strategies that brings all on board. The other issue is actually, uh, which is faced by many Muslim countries, uh, which is the bridging the gap between the outputs of higher education institutions and universities and the market. That's why we have a big problem of employability in many Muslim countries, brothers and sisters. You go and see, uh, but some countries, for example, if we take the example of uh, Malaysia here, uh, for some uh, extent, uh, uh, Turkey, uh, some other new, uh, uh, our Muslim countries, which are really moving very fast in developing their higher education system, they start solving this issue of employability, even though it's still there. But there is disparity between Muslim countries. There is uh, the issue of uh, uh, integration of knowledge, values, and specializations. What I mean here, brothers and sisters, uh, here, uh, we mean that um, we have uh, in some uh, educational systems, uh, higher education, the idea of uh, too much specialization and the, uh, the uh, disciplines become silos, become uh, separate islands, each, uh, each discipline become too much of specialization to the extent that even, even the one who specializes in Quran and Sunnah, he will not bother or uh, have any uh, link with the one who is in Usuluddin or the one who is, for example, in Quran and Sunnah. Very, uh, I'm, I'm not generalizing, but that's the situation. The one who is in sociology, he is just there in the disciplines. In Even among the disciplines in sociology, you will too much of specialization because of the uh, impact of the Western way of uh, looking at things and uh, uh, doing things. Uh, here, where that's why in the West itself, when they found this specialization become really so uh, hard, they come back to the ideas of interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary to bring back 
the the luhma, the uh, unity of knowledge. But from Islamic perspective, President Sisi, we're supposed to have unified because of the unity of knowledge, the unity of source of knowledge. You need to have unified kind of an educational system where there is integration done between the disciplines and where values and ethics and uh, uh, ethics are, are across the board, but because of secularization, we could not do that. The other thing, brother and sisters, another issue which is there in Islamic, um, uh, in, in, in higher education, uh, the lack of uh, creativity, innovation uh, in research. As I said, if I take you to the uh, uh, previous, uh, to the previous uh, slides, I brought some slides talking about the statistics of how much we spend for research. In fact, you take France as one country in Europe, one country, don't talk about USA, talk just about one country like France, or it spends more than many Muslim countries together. For example, if you uh, look at the, uh, uh, sorry, look at the output, uh, the output of uh, publication and research, I brought here some statistics talking about the output of research since 19, uh, 1996 until uh, uh, 2021. 2021, talking about how much we produce. For example, if you look, uh, let me show you here. If we look at this, for example, uh, uh, diagram here, now illustration, you will see the Muslim countries here, I highlighted them. You see uh, in all this period of time, how many documents we uh, uh, produce, for example, you take Egypt, 300,000. Uh, you take Saudi Arabia, 299,000. You take Lebanon, 45,000. Uh, uh, what publications means in ISI, in Scopus, in index journals, and so on and so forth. Uh, and and, and the, the, you see the countries here, how is the disparity? You go down to Comoros, Djibouti, and you go up here, and then you see, uh, uh, for example, let's take um, uh, other countries here you see. Uh, let me just see here, Indonesia. And now, if you want to do a comparison, sorry, uh, okay, let me, okay. If you want to look at the West, for example, let's take United States of America in terms of the, the output of research of 14 million in that period. You take, for example, uh, Canada, you take, for example, United Kingdom, you take, for example, you see, you see, and this will tell you how much uh, we spend for uh, brothers and sisters, how much we uh, spend for research as an example uh, of how we handle, for example, the uh, higher education issues. There are many things to mention to you, but let me just go back to my uh, issues here. That's when I say uh, there is a lot of uh, work needed in terms of enhancing creativity, innovation, and enhancing research and spending more for research. Because as you are all aware, brothers and sisters, now in our time, you cannot talk about sustainable development or development of societies and communities without education. Education becomes in the center, the forefront of the development. Now you have COVID-19, for example, as a very dangerous pandemic, which put the whole world in trouble and millions and billions uh, of money and uh, millions of jobs are lost. How do we solve? COVID-19, for example, we solve it through research, through uh, think tanks, through, uh, through minds, through innovation, through. So where is the Islamic world uh, in, 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 in this, for example? And this is just a simple example, which we are witnessing now, but in many other things, in the end, the Muslim world, brothers and sisters, we are still at that level of consuming, consuming the uh, Western knowledge, consuming the Western technology, consuming the Western uh, uh, products and so on and so forth. But for us, we, that's why I was talking about that unifying vision. 
and strategy for higher education in the Islamic world in the next 50 years. When are we going to be moving from the level of consuming to the level of producing knowledge, to the level of producing science and technology, to the level of uh, other levels uh, of uh, education? Now, the other issue also, which I noticed through my uh, simple research, is the, the, uh, the lack of uh, relating this one, relating or connecting universities to society, societal development. We know that most of the universities in the Islamic world, they have what they call community service, community service. But if you uh, see the studies show that the community service is just very simple uh, in many uh, Muslim universities, just to do certain activities here and there. Uh, but we are, let's say, if you take the example of IIUM in the last three years, for example, where the university is moving more towards community engagement, sustainable development, community transformation, you see what I mean here, where the university become in the forefront of the society and helping with solution, with consultancy, with transformation, uh, knowledge, transformation, knowledge, translational uh, knowledge, I think, uh, if we take the example of Malaysia here in the last 15 years, we can see a model where uh, there is a way forward to really develop higher education in the Islamic world and make higher education become more dynamic and value driven and value based. I mean, uh, I think there is a lot of to be done, but uh, I, I notice and I can acknowledge that there is a way forward now in the Islamic world. Some Muslim Some countries are showing, Some yeah. Uh, we have only two more minutes. Okay, uh, uh, very good, no Thanks problem. So, brothers uh, so and sisters, there Thanks are also that. issues uh, related to uh, governance, to management uh, of higher education. One of the things that they can mention uh, at last is, uh, for example, uh, uh, there is a lack in the preparation even of lecturers in many Islamic uh, countries, in many Muslims, not only the preparation of the student, but also lecturers. Uh, we don't have uh, well-structured programs uh, for the preparation of uh, uh, lectures in all disciplines, in all areas, and a comprehensive kind of a preparation, whether structured or pre-education or in education or after when they are in, that's actually one of the lacking things where if you go to the Arab world and you see the statistics talking about this issue of uh, uh, preparation of lectures uh, to handle higher education uh, uh, subjects, uh, there is an issue there and there is a lack. There is also a, cha a challenge and issue of financing higher education, big problem. There is an issue, uh, uh, the last issue here, which I wanted to mention now, because of COVID-19, many universities now wake up and they found that technology and use of technology, use of of, uh, uh, open education, internet uh, uh, becomes now the talk of the day, and uh, and 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 uh, 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 now that that's another challenge: how to integrate technology and uh, uh, into education now, where the online education, the virtual education, will become the norm in this post-normal things. So, brothers and sisters, uh, uh, I would like just to uh, thank you all for uh, listening, uh, because I, as I said in the beginning, the vastness of the topic, and uh, that's why I don't want to involve uh, to engage in one specific thing, but I just give you some trends, how you see uh, uh, the issues in higher education. There are a lot of things need to be done. One of the big issues also of this migration of talents in the Islamic world, millions are actually migrating and this need to be handled also. I think uh, uh, there are many things later on I will send to you the, uh, the, uh, the uh, PowerPoint, inshallah, you can benefit from it, but uh, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Prof, for such a great presentation. Uh, Shukran Jazeera Ali Fadir al-Doktor wa ja'ala Allahu ta'ala fi mizani hasan.
Sanatikum. Thanks to you lot. Now we have read the question, discussion session. Uh, flow is open. Flow is yours. So if you have questions to ask to the speaker, you can unmute yourself. Maybe I should start, okay. Brother Arif Arafat, Professor yes, Aziz. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, welcome, Doctor. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much for sharing with us your views, your suggestions, and in fact, uh, Professor Aziz, uh, you have outlined so many issues with regard to the trajectory of higher education and the conundrum that we face as well uh, in Muslim countries. I believe that uh, a lot. A lot of things that we have to do to do together, maybe uh, is that and KRK test, especially when we are talking about higher education as a service. That I think just now you talk about uh, how do we service our society through higher education activities and higher education activities that you have highlighted just now are not only uh, related to teaching. I'm not only talking about uh, graduating or producing students, but how do we address social issues? How do we conduct research? How do we generate uh, new knowledge so that the knowledge can be used to change, to improve, or to develop our society? And from your presentation, we gather that the commitment of Muslim countries towards these higher education activities is not as good or as you know, as serious as those of in so-called non-Muslim countries, right? So, yes, uh, Professor Aziz, the structure has is there, uh, but the commitment is not there. Uh, the talents are there as well. You talk about Muslim talent moving to outside their countries to serve uh, universities outside their countries, leaving behind uh, their own people whom they need to uh, guide whom they need to develop. I think, uh, Professor Aziz, this year, uh, our Ibadah camp uh, will elaborate, will deliberate Surah at tawbah Ayat uh, 122, which talk about the importance of people going out, seek knowledge. And the uh, mafhum from this ayah is that we, higher education provider, should be providing best services to people who come to seek knowledge from us. However, they are, like I said, there's no conundrum, issues, Okay, that uh, hamper us from doing our should be task. Right, the first ayah in the Quran talk about Iqra and Iqra actually tell us uh, not only to read but to also uh, provide services for people to do Iqra. And Iqra here is not only reading but it includes research as well. Now, moving forward, Professor Aziz, uh, you said that a lot more have to be done Okay, to train uh, our people, okay, to train higher education leaders. But I think we, we, have, we are good at our subject matters. Okay, we are good at our knowledge, but we are not that good in terms of leading our institution. Okay, how do we empower, how do we enable our Muslim academics so that they can uh, lead their institution, they can even substantiate the institution so that we can do what other good universities are doing as well. Professor Aziz, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Prof. I think when you speak, you, you are speaking, uh, I can identify your philosophy of education already. You see, that's why I, when you listen to some Muslim uh, scholars or administrators or in higher education, the, the, the moment you listen to him, you can identify the philosophy behind uh, what he is doing. And that's what I am saying, uh, that we, what kind of philosophy that we need for the Muslim ummah, that will tell us what kind of graduate we need, what kind of research we need, what kind of governance we need. In, in our university, we talk about 
value-based governance, value-based leadership, but, value, but in other places which is more secular, they will talk more on sophisticated skills uh, of how you manage, how you govern, how you do KPIs, how you do that, how you do that, but they don't uh, put up a surah at tawbah, for example, or what you mentioned, means, means this need to be really uh, addressed, uh, uh, Prof. Shukran. Now, when it comes to higher education uh, in the Islamic world, uh, we really, as you said rightly, we need experts. Do we have today, I give you just one example, Prof. Can we list down in the Islamic world today, how many we have of think tank centers on the futures of higher education? How many we have experts who can tell us the futures of Islamic education or higher education uh, in the world or in the next 50 years. So we haven't prepared, we haven't prepared the human capital that will address the issues of our higher education within our own context for our own purpose, for our own objective without generalization, of course. But when I was trying to prepare this uh, presentation, I was looking for a futuristic uh, uh, Muslim educationalist, for example, uh, to see what, 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 what do they say, or a think tank group, what do they say? I found uh, Sestrik doing some of the uh, studies, but but it's a lot of uh, a lot of work. Uh, as as I said in IIUM, for example, when we look at education from value based or from the philosophy of Islam, from uh, we we really need to groom more scholars inside IIUM to become think tanks to become uh, really uh, in the forefront leading Islamic value based modern education. Where when people ask. Uh, about uh, this type of education. Ah, we have this doctor, we have this professor, we have this expert, we have this. That's the lacking which we have really in managing the um, higher education. And the answer will be, Prof, uh, we need to look at higher education as an ecosystem. One of the things that I found in dealing with higher education in, the, in some Muslim countries is they, 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 look it, they look at it as segmented issue. You have issue of teachers, go and address that issue, but not link to the issue of research, issue of governance, issue of management, issue of financing, issue means we don't deal really uh, with the, uh, the, the, the issues. Now, now this issue of preparing teachers is separated from many other things which must be linked to it. So that's why I said, uh, alhamdulillah, uh, one of the good things we learn from the, uh, these successful models of education in the West, for example, like Finland or Switzerland or Canada or Japan, for that matter, two things were important there. This, this ecosystem or the system approach comprehensive and number two, the value. They base everything on a value. There is a value or not. In, in some cases of our, uh, Prof. Shukran, in the case of many of our universities, the issue is not actually uh, to talk about the quality of what you produce. No, the number of what you produce. How many you produced? How many graduates? Uh, 3,000, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. Then you bring them out and then many are jobless because you don't have that system uh, or ecosystem where you see higher education as interlinked, interconnected thing and you plan for it as a whole, not go for this, then the, the other thing will bring you down. This is just a general Thanks. comment. I think, uh, I think we, can, uh, uh, we can design many good uh, programs uh, to prepare our lecturers, our administrators, our academicians. I give you one simple example. Uh, in Malaysia here, uh, in the ministry, they have a cap, a cap, which is a ministry uh, body dedicated for leadership training of the leaders. You don't find this in many Muslim countries. So that's one thing that we can have plus. And then okay. Malaysia can teach others on this. And there is something in UAE or in Turkey, they can also benefit, others can benefit. So that's what I say, we need that unifying, uh, come together and have that strategy, that platform which puts, uh, benefits everyone. Okay. 
Go okay, ahead. okay. Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, Prof. Fatimir is raising his uh, hand. Okay, welcome, Prof. Fatimir. <laughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, thank you very much, the Prof. Abdulaziz. Um, this is a very uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, so uh, I believe that uh, will benefit a lot, inshallah, if that is going to be applied. Now, when, when we compare the previous system of education that we had in the Muslim world, uh, when you look at the great scholars, they were meant just only for research base. They produced a lot of literature. When you look at the learned scholars, what else, and, and in the West as well, they have these research center communities. So they don't give them like other workloads. Like if we look at our university, for example, uh, if we have in each department a research based center where professors will focus on research to solve the problems, and instead of having teachings like uh, 12 credit hours and research, community engagement, all these activities. I think we can solve the problem, but if you are, uh, you are, you are having like everything in one, then I think uh, we'll not be able to achieve what you have mentioned here. Because when I look at the West, I have contact with some of uh, the lectures there, especially those who are dealing with research, and we are wondering how they are able to produce a book within a period, with a short period of time. Whereas when we get a research, that will take maybe years for us to produce a book. Why? Because of other activities that we are engaged as teachers. Now, if we are going to separate uh, teaching uh, activity and the research activity, then the, I think the productivity will be very high and uh, the problems can be solved easily. At least if you get some experts, like uh, if we say that like in the West, they maintain those experts until the end of, of their life and they make use of them uh, and they, for research basis, as well as for postgraduate basis, when you mentioned the higher, education system, like when I look at the postgraduate especially, uh, so they facilitate them. So they don't give them any kind of teaching or community engagement, whatever it is. That is based on voluntary basis, whereas the task that is given to them, it is just only very specific and focused. And that's why we can see a lot of product, you know, compared to yeah. the Muslim world, what you mentioned is. So yeah. if, if I say, according to my humble uh, observation, if we start to have this in our university, we have research center, but research center is trying to give us tasks adding to the main tasks that we have as teachers. So this is what I see here. Another thing that even some others mentioned, I think maybe money is not a problem. When you look at here in Malaysia, there are a lot of research grants that are provided by, I mean, the Ministry of Higher Education. But the thing is the focus. If we have a very specific focus for certain experts, like you mentioned, the think tankers, so that would be very useful for our university, inshallah. So this yeah. is my humble observation, Prof. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Dr. Fatmir. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, you start coming down to the real uh, practical uh, uh, situations and contexts. For me, I was just trying to show certain trends so that I put the people in the context. It's very complicated uh, issue, higher education uh, in the Islamic world. Uh, uh, that's why I think when it comes to what you propose now regarding the, uh, the load, for example, the academic load of the staff, this one, it's about the internal engineering of the university and how we manage, uh, how we manage the uh, time of people for research, for teaching, for, and, and unfortunately in some uh, Muslim uh, countries, these things are related to policies and policies are done by uh, ministries. And sometimes the policies, the policies which are done, uh, they are not maybe in favor of what the university uh, wants to do. But if you are taking, for example, the example of IIUM, I have been here for a long time, I think there is enough flexibility uh, for uh, our uh, management of the university uh, to really design a very flexible way and model of how we, uh, we create synergy uh, in uh, teaching research. For example, I give you an example. When I was the, uh, during my, our time, uh, the previous management, uh, there was a proposal uh, which we discussed at that time uh, to come up with 
streams like the research stream, the teaching stream, and the community engagement stream. Uh, and, and I think uh, even uh, our current uh, management is looking at that one. And it's, it's, it's a kind of how you engineer the resources which you have and provide, uh, provide time for those who are really great researchers and give them all the ecosystem needed. And those who are really teachers and, and they can make really great kudwa as a teacher, create that ecosystem that can simplify for them. And then in the end, what will happen uh, when you look at it as an ecosystem, you will see, okay, uh, these people focusing on research covering for this side, these people focusing on teaching covering for this side and community engagement also. I think it can be done. And I see that what happened in UIE in the last uh, two, three years and the new uh, policies, the new way of empowering uh, the lecturer, empowering the deans, empowering the policies are there. The guidelines are there. I think it's a matter of the will to move, uh, to walk the talk and uh, the uh, deans to look, to look at. I remember the rector in one of the uh, Senate uh, mentioned that the, the deans are empowered, uh, not only specifically for this, uh, this uh, issue of uh, uh, workload, uh, but that idea of empowering, uh, it's there. And I think it's more on the creativity uh, and the collaboration and the collective effort of the deans and the, the middle management and top management to move forward. And I, uh, I wish to see this thing happening now. Last comment on Prof. Wahid uh, in the chat here, talks about financing and funding. In, in Malaysia here and in many other parts of the world, they have this model of uh, quadruple, uh, quadruple uh, helix uh, model of managing the universities where they have the government, they have the civil society, they have the society, they have the university, they have the industry, and it's more on the linkages and the communication. There are a lot of funds here and there, but if you don't have an office or you don't have a way how you reach them, a way how you get them, a way how you facilitate, uh, you cannot get those grants. Other universities can get them. It's more not because of the lack of resources or money, but sometimes it's the way how we uh, go for it uh, and create the linkages uh, to get it. Many, many, for example, many uh, Western universities, even though they they have their own resources, like Oxford or many others, they got a lot of uh, funding from Middle East, from many uh, countries, from Qatar Foundation, from Kuwait, from UAE, from this. They have the ways how to do. But I think with this idea of quadruple uh, helix model where we need to create synergy between uh, society, government, uh, industry, and in fact, in fact, I give you just one example, one proposal, one suggestion. You are talking about suggestion. Now, under the OIC, we have ICESCO, we have OIC, we have IDB. And IDB is trying to support science and technology. Uh, and they put some funds there. What is our way of getting those funds? Many are benefiting from that. I give you another simple example. What if each Muslim country put one million US dollar, one million US dollar every year for research. And that 75 million US dollar uh, put it in some priority research for Muslim countries and bring it as grants for, uh, uh, for the people. Uh, and uh, there are many ways to do, but I think uh, uh, when we come to the real context, we need to look at the uh, circumstances and situations. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, our time is almost supposed to finish, but uh, we, we can give a time only for question. Uh, Dr. Hazizan, okay, you're welcome. Okay, yes, thank you very much, uh, Brother Arafat, uh, Brother Dean, and also Professor Abdul Aziz. Ajumma'ah mubarakah, insha'Allah. Thank from... you very much. Congratulations. Masha'Allah. Thank you for the very uh, important and nice uh, presentation. Um, of course, we can talk about the different realities in different uh, 
member countries of the OIC, particularly because maybe we can consider OIC to be United Nations for Contemporary Muslim Society. And the hope is very high on um, OIC to play the role of what you always mentioned about unifying. For example, in education sector, maybe uh, our ideal expectation would be um, the formulation of the vision of education for all, uh, at least uh, member countries of the OIC. But um, uh, having studied the reality that uh, we could see in the past in terms of ability of OIC also to uh, design a policy whereby the decision at the central level could also be implemented at the uh, nation state level, um, they are not bound to, to decide to implement and also to follow. I think this is one of the important issues at the international level when we talk about the effectiveness of implementing any good policy for global transformation for the Ummah. So what I'm trying to give an impression is that while we can talk about the scattered efforts at different uh, levels, uh, lower levels, which are excellent and good and of varying degree of successes and also implementation, I think the uh, most important and effective um, transformation would be uh, facilitated by the by the higher level of authority representing Muslims nowadays, which is OIC. So, what is actually your your view on the effectiveness of implementing the ideal concept of education that is integrated, which is based on the uh, holistic. Uh, and, and a holistic education concept as well as integrated knowledge, which is very much desired. To what extent we can hope that this can take place in a, uh, at a certain expected level for some foreseeing years to come, because we cannot continue talking about this without seeing the result. For example, I have published also one paper on exactly on this, Presenting, for example, the 57 countries or IIC achieved three point something in the, if I'm not mistaken, in the publication or science and technology compared to only one country of the other country, for example, 20%, 30%. So it is shameful on that. But, but uh, based on this fact, how would you see the, the important effort on the part of Muslim at the level of OIC that can accommodate this desire of the Muslim to push forward and make it happen within certain period of time, uh, rather than just to continue from 1969 and 70 until now on the issue of Palestine. And so <laughs> that triggered the, the, the establishment of OIC. Allah Alam, I'm sorry to take uh, time to make my point clearer to you. I'm not sure whether you are clear or not. Thank you very much for and congratulations. Uh, thank, you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you, you so much, Dr. Hazizan. Uh, but our Professor Abdul Hamid also is raising his hand. Uh, okay, Prof. Welcome. In short, thank you so much, Prof. Am I clear? Am I clear? Yeah, yeah. You are audible. Audible. How are you, Sabah al Khair? I am so glad because. The, the, the moderator is my supervisee and the presenter yeah. my guru, uh, Abdul Aziz in my ustaz. I'm so happy. Inshallah. <laughs> uh, welcome, bro. Uh, my, my, my short comment is about uh, the uh, moderation. I mean, the, the role of high education institution, uh, institutions, I mean, it, it is so hard to say. Uh, should be focused only on uh, education or teaching and learning uh, or uh, publication publication but in my in my humble view uh, based on what uh, prof uh, fatmir had just uh, suggested uh, it is not to, to to divide or to say some lecturers if they are given the opportunity to focus only on teaching and some others to be given the opportunity to focus only on, on publication. Uh, I think uh, moderation in time management is extremely important. 
uh, I think many of us, including myself, we are stuck somewhere where we are unable to finish our uh, publications, especially the uh, textbook given to us or the research grant given to us because of the, uh, uh, and the teaching load. Yeah, this is a fact. As a matter of fact, we have to mention it. But also uh, in contrast, there are some lecturers who are good in time management. They are doing uh, social activities, uh, they're doing da'wah, yeah, managing uh, so many activities. At the same time, very punctual in, in submitting the, the uh, research grants on time, finishing all the publications on time, and also very uh, accurate in, in, in doing so many things. So I think the problem is time management. While, yeah, true, and while the, the, the kulia uh, should also uh, pay attention or take into consideration the proposal of uh, Dr. Fatmir, I think also we lecturers, we need sometimes to have uh, the uh, time management uh, and effectiveness used in both, not both, in, in, in three aspects, publication, yeah. teaching at the same time, and social work. Shukran Jazeera, Assalamu Alaikum. Dr. Thank you, thank you. Hamid, uh, okay. Let me just uh, uh, co very quickly comment. Uh, Dr. Hamid, thank you very much. I think what we, uh, when we talk about teaching and uh, research and uh, community engagement and other commitment, in fact, we are not talking about um, you do one thing and you leave the others. No, uh, it's like balance, but there is like a percentage. Uh, every lecture must have research and teaching and community engagement, but uh, you give, let's say, those who want to go for research, they can go do more research and less on other things, but there should be balance. Otherwise, we cannot manage the system. Uh, that's one. Uh, I come back to uh, Dr. Hazizan, always nice to hear what he says, a wise man. Um, uh, in fact, uh, just to uh, clarify, the, when I mentioned about that unifying, or I, I don't uh, mean to have like, because it will never happen, it's impossible to have, to have like unified uh, kind of uh, uh, strategy, which uh, each and every Muslim country uh, will uh, implement like, unif like uniformity. No, what I mean is, uh, is like we have a guiding and uh, a kind of uh, guiding visions, like the, like the vision for science and technology 2041 for the OIC, where they have at least outlined uh, a clear uh, vision with indicators and so on and so forth. So I think for higher education, uh, the, we need to have things like this, wh which brings us together. I noticed like this. Uh, what is really needed is there are many Muslim countries who are already who have already moved in terms of managing their higher education, in terms of quality, governance, research, uh, community engagement. We need we need more intensified cooperation to benefit from one another. Uh, and that, that's where the ISESCO needs to play a more greater role in bringing, for example, what Malaysia is great at to the rest. And not just uh, in terms of talking about it, in terms of putting the techniques, the ways, how to do that. For example, Pakistan or Iran, they have very, uh, they are very well versed in certain areas, in certain types of research. Uh, then how do we really get those uh, uh, skills or those uh, uh, expertise uh, to be, we create that uh, system where we really benefit from each other. Because as I said, you have some are moving forward, some are in the middle, some are still kept in the very, uh, because of your context and situation. And I hope, inshallah, uh, uh, that there will be some kind of uh, walking the talk. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, expertise, there is a lot of expertise, a lot of things, but uh, the way how uh, uh, to put it uh, ready for the Ummah, for other countries, we need to do a lot on this and we need to uh, really provide our expertise to others. Nowadays, in some cases, if you want to have expertise of another university, you have to pay for it. You have to, uh, to uh, uh, can we move forward uh, and really uh, 
have that idea of shared ilm, shared knowledge, which is an Islamic uh, concept. Now, the last thing to end, I want to say, like uh, Dr. Hazizan mentioned, how we are going to uh, go uh, forward. I give you an example. IIUM, IIUM, after 40 years, I think we are becoming a leading model of an integrated value-based education, which is uh, taking Islam in the core. And also we are following the, the new norms of governance, management, leadership, and so on and so forth. This model, uh, of uh, I think our rector you, uh, usually uh, tells uh, says like it's like humanized education or value based education with all this. Uh, I think what we can do, we look at our experience of forty years, we package it nicely, theoretically and practically, and we try to introduce it to other Islamic universities in the Muslim world. Let's bring on board. There are hundreds of Islamic universities who are very far from what is UIE uh, today uh, 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 in terms of the model itself, practically and in the real context, there might be uh, differences and issues and problems, but I'm talking as a model, we can have the first level of collaboration is with our own Islamic university where we tell them this is how we see the model of Islamic education, contemporary one, with all this sophisticated governance and management and uh, all these things. And then together, we take that model and disseminate it so that it becomes part and parcel of the Islamic education, higher education in the Islamic world. We help one another. Then from there, we move to, the, we move this model to other universities, whether secular or even today, when you talk about our model to even Western universities and you show them the real, uh, what we have as a model theoretically and practically and this, they will be very astonished and surprised how an Islamic university is like this. Okay, how, how we integrate uh, governance and knowledge and planning and, 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 and human talent development and managing human resources and values and put them all together in a model. Uh, and we are winning awards and we are, uh, uh, especially when we put all what we are doing in the, uh, this context of sustainable development. I tell you that sustainable development today become the leading or the driving force of almost 193 countries of the world. All their educational systems or health systems or now are aligning to this model of United Nations. What is best about us is we adapt, but we have in the core our seven missions. The mission of integration, the mission of value education, the mission of uh, ethical leadership, the mission of uh, value pay. This is actually what we need to promote to the world. This one, I'm talking theoretically, but I know that practically when even you come to uh, our universities, you will find issues and problems as mentioned by our brothers and sisters. But what is important and what the Ummah needs, need successful models so that they can model them, they can follow them, qudwa. And then from that qudwa, you create qudwa, qudwa, qudwa. And then you create a new culture of how you manage higher education. And I am sure that Muslim countries under the OIC and under ISESCO and the Arab League of Universities, Ittihad Jami'at Al-Alam Al-Islami, Rabbit al if they all come together, I think we can do a lot of things that we have a lot of potentials, but putting them together in a direction, in a vision, in, in a concerted effort, I think will give us a momentum. That's what I want to say. Okay, okay, Prof. Thank you so much. We had a very nice session and fascinating discussion. Uh, thanks a lot to whoever contributed to discussion, Prof. Shukran, Dean, Ahas, Islamic Revealed Knowledge and Human Sciences. Uh, Prof. Fatmir, Dr. Hazizan, and Prof. Abdul Hamid Zaroum. Thanks a lot. Rabbuna ya taqabbal minna salih amalina.
We have come to the end of the program. On behalf of the organizer, I would like to thank uh, Prof. Dr. Abdul Aziz uh, Barwuth for inspiring us young researchers and students on our roles and responsibilities. We hope that everyone will embrace and uphold your words of wisdom in their journey to be successful academics and researchers in the future. I would like to take this opportunity to apologize for my shortcomings in hosting the sessions. I wish the organizers, the participants, all the best and may Allah bless our effort in this journey of knowledge. Before we end, let's turn on our camera so we can take picture together. Please, uh, everyone, keep on camera and please smile. Thanks, Art. Okay, is it done? Is it done? <laughs> Please confirm. Anyone? Somebody has to take the picture, but I have that um, feature on my laptop. Brother Ashash, Brother Arafat, do you have that feature on your laptop? I don't have, but anyone can do it. Um, Who is helping there? I'm a Marshall. All right, thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, is it done? Oh, okay, done. Right. Okay, Prof. Asiana, thank you so much for yes, your concern. Jazakumullah khairan. Uh, thank you very much, and let's end with tasbih and dua. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم العص إن الإنسان لفي خص إلا الذين منوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر جزاكم الله خيرا شكرا Thank you very much السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته عليكم السلام ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله شكرا جزيلا دكتور الله يبارك فيك أهلا بكم شكرا يا سعادة الرئيس ما شاء الله موديريتر عظيم هزي شكرا جزيلا دكتور نراكم بالخير نراكم بالخير شكرا بروفيسور حسلينا ما شاء الله تريند اس فيري ويل شكرا جزيلا ثانك يو دكتور حسلينا ثانك يو ثانك يو بروفيسور ثانك يو